Hey there, everybody. Welcome to our review of Netflix's You, Season 3, Episode 2. We are already going in a lot of different directions. We are already in the, oh, we can pour cement over this dead body and that will make it go away. Yeah, I I said in the premiere, which we'll leave a link for you below in the description, that I thought that this whole season was going to be kind of about Joe facing who he really is and Love facing more who she is and that it might have gone on over the season, but it all happened in this episode. <laughs> Things moved rather quickly, and at the same time, I also have this just, like, feeling in the back of my head that this is basically Joe going to a pharmacy, grabbing a giant band-aid, putting it on his forehead, and then writing, I'm okay, on that band-aid, hoping that everything is just better. Yeah, we're gonna get into that <laughs> and all of the rest of it, including... The neighbor's creepy kid that has given me some real bad vibes, Theo. I am looking at you. But before we get into that, hit that subscribe button. We are going to have a new You review every single day until we're done with the season. So make sure you're subscribed. Okay. Can we, you just mentioned Theo. Let's just start with Theo because he's at the end of this episode and this dude is like mad creepy. Oh, he's real creepy. The, the minute that Love was explaining in therapy this interaction that she had with this college kid named Theo, who yeah. was, you know, acting very helpful. Let me help you with your groceries and yeah. this and that and whatever. And Love shut that down right away. Yeah. She said, I am married. I have a kid. You know, goodbye sort of thing. He was not having it. No. Like, he really wasn't. He was still trying to act like he was fine, but throwing in some real creepy comments, like, you have a banging body, very, like, entitled, not really going to take no for an answer. He's giving me some, like, bad things are going to happen from Theo to love later on. I'm sure you all know what I'm thinking. Listen, the you guys all know the color of this shirt, right? Like that is that is the color of the flags that are all around the the moment he mentions and talks about her body. This is just like one of those things. Like you don't say this to somebody you don't know unless you've got some really messed up things going on in your head. It is not a compliment. <laughs> Women don't want to just meet somebody and have them start talking about their body. It is real creep show so at the end of the episode we learned that this same kid theo yeah. is matthew the neighbor who is the husband of natalie who is now dead so when she went over there to sort of see what was going on test the waters yeah. natalie's been dead nobody's saying nothing so love went over with some cupcakes to kind of be like hey these are for you how's everything going they all answered the door and it was so creepy. It, that whole scene, I was just so uncomfortable with all of it. I was uncomfortable with Theo answering the door. I was uncomfortable with Matthew being, you know, we're, we're taking care of something right now, which is never a good sign when you see somebody say that on the other side of the door. No, and we did see the cops pull up at the end of the episode. But Matthew, okay, so we said this in the premiere that something's real weird about him. The yeah. fact that he had cameras on the inside of his house, monitoring yeah. his wife, real weird. Then it gets creepier <laughs> and weirder. So he's invented some sort of ring that will monitor like your body temperature. We've, we've seen stuff like this, yeah. with, like Fitbits and you know, those sleep wrist watches yeah. and all that. But this will monitor, like, everything. Everything about your body temperature, sort of your blood sugar, where you are. <laughs> and not only is Natalie wearing these, which is, uh-oh, you know, she's buried yeah. with them. But all of the other people in this community have willingly put on these rings for him. I understand friendship, but, like, no, Matthew, you're not going to monitor where I go. 
this is like Skynetville. Like I would not be even remotely comfortable because this is like one of those sort of things where let's say you're not even doing anything like untoward or whatever, but what if you, well, since love has a bakery now, let's, what, what if you have a really serious baked goods addiction and you don't want everybody else to know that they're in there like stuffing your face with cupcakes like every single day? Like this thing is just so, the idea of it is terrifying. Like who has an impulse being like, I want to know today where everyone in my town is at every given moment. Like, who who comes up with that? Yeah, and in a town where everybody has secrets. And, I mean, in life everybody has secrets. But these people all feel like they've got stuff that they don't want to share. Yeah. I'm actually really surprised that Matthew was able to get anybody to put these rings on at all. Like, very, very odd. That part of the story didn't match up for sort of what they've set up where it's like oh it's a suburban full of secrets here put on these rings so that your one neighbor knows where you are at all times it's making me feel like matthew has a lot more influence in the community than you know maybe we know about right now it's just i'm really feeling like maybe these rings or the fact that he does have cameras everywhere and he is monitoring everything so closely, he's going to figure out what is going on. Like he has to, how can you have all these cameras, and all this data and you can't figure it out. I, I think he's totally going to figure it out. Like I, I, I think that that feels almost inevitable to me. And it's like, I'm, I'm wondering a lot of, okay, it seems like these people in this town are very superficial. It seems like they're very financially motivated. They like having money. They like showing off their money. I wonder, you know, did Matthew pay these people to put on these rings? Is there some sort of financial motivation to it? Did he tell them the full story about them? Because, yeah, like you said, it doesn't make sense. It, it feels like we're getting into some sort of like weird like pseudo utopia that's not really utopia community that's like master planned or some garbage with the everyone is willing to put on the <laughs> rings for matthew he is our robot leader it's just like that that just starts to get a little too weird even for this show yeah the only thing i can think of is that maybe i mean every there's like a high seems to be a hierarchy yeah. in this friend circle maybe he's just at the top and has the most influence that the rest of the people are like ah it's harmless you want to know that i went to the gym sure i just don't really care and that kind of feeling it's making me wonder though if Matthew's going to be the one that figures out about love or if it's going to be Theo and that there's going to be a bit of a blackmail situation going on with Theo and his new neighbors. I just came up with an idea while you were even just talking there. Like, what if, what if Matthew invented this because he knows that Theo is messed up and he wants to know where Theo is at every given moment, at every given place. This is another edition of our theories that may be disproven watching the next episode. Yeah, I mean, already this this is what I like about this show is that it is not predictable. No. I thought we were going to have sort of uh, an evolution of this therapy and love and Joe trying to figure themselves out for a little bit longer than an episode. But the therapy stuff was really good. They did sort of show where each of them are and that they are both really in the same spot, which is that they're afraid that if the mask slips and people get to know who they really are, that they're just going to be left and that they both feel the same way. And that's the thing that has brought them together, that commonality where they're, they're kind of like, we're going to be a team. I think it was really, really well written. I, I think the therapist character is really interesting. Some of the things she said to them are interesting. Like, oh, you know, a lot of my, you know, couples that I see, they want to kill each other here or there. The, the question that I sort of have with all of it is Joe has this like epiphany in this episode that's like, oh, I can be a team. You know, I can, I can trust love. She can be this great, wonderful person for me. And I mean, maybe they're trying to do sort of a commentary of out of, everyone who gets told certain things. You go through this phase where you're like, oh, this is perfect. The light is shining down. Everything is better. But it's like therapy doesn't really work where you have a session and then you're just like all better now. And then you start seeing sunshine. Like there needs to be like a downfall here. There needs to be a moment where things 
don't necessarily fall apart completely, but they just sort of realize, oh, this is really not that easy. We actually do need to keep working at it. Yeah, and I foresee that that little bit of mistrust is still there. I mean, they built a, a glass cage together, so <laughs> they're feeling together, that they're doing this together for a just-in-case. They made a promise to each other we are not going to kill anymore. We're going to make it so you and you don't have to kill anymore. We're going to get to this good spot. But just in case, we'll build a cage. But then they both hide keys somewhere in this cage because the trust is just not completely there yet, which I truly appreciate it. Yeah. It really shouldn't be like you said. They get out of therapy and the sun is shining and the butterflies are flying. No, there still needs to be some work. I love I, I love that somehow this ridiculous cage is still a part of the show three seasons in. It's like season two. I still have a lot of questions as to how he just randomly put together this cage in the storage locker, like completely out of nowhere. I actually like that we saw somewhat of a construction of it. I still it's apparently it's really easy to get all of the raw materials to put together your magic. Mm -hmm. We're gonna lock you in a cage cage because it still came together really fast. Yeah, I mean, they still they obviously still have things to work out yeah. together. There was, we saw Joe was having a lot of resentment at the beginning of this episode towards love for her being impulsive, which is something that she wants to be able to work on and get through because it does put them in these types of situations. Joe, he really does want to just feel normal and there is unfortunately no real way for him to do that if he's going to be with someone who is still going to continue to act like this or kill or these things are going to happen as he said he doesn't want to be 70 years old and still burying bodies he was looking for somebody who isn't like him so that he would be able to stop what he's doing he thinks that's the magic plug yeah and then move forward but because love is like him and she's impulsive when she does it he was really resentful that he had to deal with natalie and deal with natalie's body and deal with the cleanup and getting angrier and angrier about this joe i know i know you're watching here 12 minutes in i have so i have some advice for you and please don't come and kill me after i say this but you put Benji in the cage in season one, and you had no idea what you were going to do after the fact with that. You just sort of did it. So you know what? You're just a little bit impulsive here too, buddy. So how about you shut your trap? Well, Joe in general, the dude is mad hypocritical. Like, he is very fascinating and dark and twisted. I would not want to be his friend in real life. He is, nope, 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 nope. But it is interesting hearing him continue to be an unreliable narrator and even rail and complain about love when to some extent he still does the same things even if he claims he wants to be better that doesn't change the actual actions i think that they both do want to be better yes. but they are both impulsive and it for this to actually end up working because he admitted in therapy that the only reason he has stayed is for their son henry and not for love, they they really do need to find that commonality that will keep them together, as the therapist said. And we did get near to the end of the episode where they really had that big fight outside where she said, listen, you know, I don't trust you and you don't trust me. You don't trust me that I'm, you know, unable to stop killing people well i don't trust that you won't kill me because if i hadn't said i was pregnant i'd be dead right now and at any minute that you decide that you don't want to be with me anymore i'm just gonna be killed i i love that you bring that up i love that the episode brought this up because this was one of my really big problems with the end of last season was just this moment happens and they didn't really spend a lot of time addressing it and they didn't even spend a lot of time addressing it in the premiere where you know he did come very very close to killing her and it was her announcing she was pregnant that changed it obviously this would stick with her obviously going through this therapy got her to a place where she was comfortable enough to an extent to mention it to really bring this to the forefront and i just i think it is going to be a huge huge theme this season where she struggles with this idea of 
I'm still here, but why am I still here? What is my value to Joe if something happens? Is he going to do this again? Because I know he is capable of it. Which is why she hid the key, and that exactly. all makes sense. But at the same time, he hid one too. It's just, they're not there yet. And I'm really glad that they didn't just wrap it all up in a bow in this episode, that they just had this great understanding of each other. It feels like a good first step. Like you said, they have yeah. work to still put in, but with what's going on next door over at Matthew and Natalie's house now that she's gone, they're really going to have to learn to depend on each other and work with each other. I am still worried that love is going to not make it out of this season alive. Okay, there's a few moments in this episode that are very small, but I very much love them. Number one, Sherry. How dare you not let your kid eat the raspberries? Like, what? You're the real monster here. Like, no, I'm, I'm kidding, but come on. Oh my goodness, it's so. I mean, it's, and it, it's an exaggeration yeah. of out here. Are there people out here that are like that? Sure, there's people like that everywhere that are very careful about every little piece of sugar that comes yeah. in their body. But I mean, it's just. It's so ridiculous and pretty unrelatable to us. I just also love the meat grinder confession coming out in the middle of the episode. That he's like, I did this. You did this at a number? And he's like, yeah. She's like, I used that. <laughs> I'm sure. It's okay, it's okay, love. I'm sure Joe cleaned it after the fact. Oh. Fingers crossed. We don't need a Sweeney Todd situation oh my here. Goodness, but no. it was. I, I, I like that there was these couple of moments kind of interspersed in here. I am kind of curious to see if Joe gets the job at, you know, the library, what that... Because I was kind of wondering, neither one of these people at the start of this season are really actually working in any capacity. No, and now that, you know, Love knows that the Quinn money's a little in flux, yeah. where her mom has really said that there's some struggles that are coming in right now. She just signed a three-year lease and her bakery is empty. And then we also saw Sherry running by and giving her this real super dirty look. Sherry is not long for no. this season. I, I'm calling it right now. There is no way. She's so dislikable. Yeah. And she also does have her finger on the town. And yeah. if, if Love wants her bakery to succeed, Sherry is going to kind of have to go. If, if, if she can't eat a raspberry, then nobody can eat a raspberry. There's a very interesting undercurrent that the you, the producers of you, I'm going to talk to you guys now. What did influencers do to you guys? Because you really hate influencers on this show. You got like Peach, Sherry, like all, I mean, 40 to a certain extent. Like yep. you guys either killing all of them or you're just making all of them like the worst people. I know. It's, it's definitely there's something there. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I think episode one took me for a little bit more of a loop. I had more of a surprise factor, but I'm not going to lie. I'm coming out of episode two here. I'm really curious for where things are going to go. Like, I'm still really enjoying this season a lot. I'm really enjoying this season, especially now that they they have brought in this, like, very strange Theo and Matthew. There is a lot of mystery around these two creeps. Yeah. So two creeps living <laughs> next door to two murderers. I do just don't know where this is going to go. And I love it. I love that Scott Speedman is playing one of them, especially, you know, because we've seen him on Animal Kingdom and he's on Grey's Anatomy right now, too. And he's just like, he, he looks like just like the Captain America, sort of like, you know, good-looking dude who can do sort of no wrong. Obviously, in Animal Kingdom, he's not that either, but it's just, like, he's really good at, like, these, like, weird, twisted characters. Yeah, kind of like Homelander over on the boys. <laughs> yes, yes. We have the you Homelander now. But, uh, <laughs> all right, well, what do you guys think about you, Season 3, Episode 2? Give us your immediate reactions to when you stopped watching this episode in the comments. Subscribe. We will be back Every day, yep. talking about this show. Thank you guys so much. We will see you here next time.